Sorry to narrate out loud. <laughs> I had many people send messages ahead of time to ask, will this be recorded? And so before I even begin, I will start by saying, yes, we are recording. We will post this to the Washington Conservation District's YouTube page tomorrow, and I will send out a link to everybody who registered for the workshop, and we will also post it on the Washington Conservation District website. We um, typically post a PDF of the slides and then also the recording of the presentation so that you can easily go back and find that information if you weren't taking your notes quite quickly enough because it's going to be a lot of information. Um, I am overjoyed to introduce co-presenter James Wolfen tonight, who is kind of our preeminent bee lawn expert in Minnesota. And um, if I am able to, oh, suddenly, oh, that's right. James told me, click on the thing, and then I can click to forward the slides. Um, we're going to kind of bounce back and forth, the two, of the, the two of us. I'll start with a bit of an introduction to our topic tonight. Turn it over to James for the meat of the presentation, and then follow up with local resources for those of you who are here in Minnesota, specifically in the East Metro area. Um, but James, do you want to say anything about yourself before I get carried away on welcome and intros? Yeah, for sure. First of all, uh, I am so grateful that Angie lets me share the virtual stage with her. Uh, mm -hmm. Those of you, some of you might know her as Angie, some of you might know her as Minnesota Nature Awesomeness. Either way, it's a pleasure. Um, so yeah, I moved to Minnesota from New York. I saw we've got at least one other New Yorker here about seven years ago to work on this bee lawn project where I am an entomologist by trade. I am a bee conservation guy. I was actually housed in both the University of Minnesota's entomology lab, the bee conservation lab to be specific, as well as the turf grass science lab, where those are kind of two sectors of science that are normally isolated from one another. But I think what this project did, it does a really great job of kind of thinking about how we can use some alternative forms of vegetation to promote both pollinator conservation and the conservation of natural resources within this turf grass environment where kind of the overall message here that I try to share with folks is, you know, we no longer have to impress the British monarchs in our front lawns. We can try and start to better use these areas for conservation purposes. So as we go through this, we'll talk about bee lawns as well as some other turf alternatives. Try to think of what your goals are for your yard and the different planting options as we go through them which of these options are gonna be best suited for you, the needs of you, your family, et cetera. Wonderful. Um, so a little bit of an introduction to the organizations that I am representing tonight. We have the East Metro Water Education Program and the Lower St. Croix Watershed Partnership, which are two overlapping local government partnerships. And within this area that you see shaded- Within this area that you see shaded on the map, we've got 30 local government partners that are representing cities, counties, soil and water conservation districts and watershed districts, um, all working together collaboratively to educate the public, engage landowners and work with local communities on water protection and improvement projects. Um, so I just wanted to list some of the things that the local partners are able to help you with if you happen to live in one of these communities. Um, usually able to do free site visits for landowners if you're interested in a project and you need a little bit of help to get started or especially if you have large acreage and you're thinking of doing something like converting um, row crops into prairie or trying to figure out how to manage a woodland area. Um, many of the organizations offer cost share grants to help offset costs. Uh, we do a lot of workshops and volunteer events, project tours, community programs, um, and have a wealth of expertise among all of the different staff people in these organizations. All right, um, so what we're going to be talking about today, just going to frame the conversation a little bit with why now why this is such a critical issue for us to be talking about at this time. And then James is going to get really deep dive into the how to's. What are the turf alternatives that are out there that you could be considering which one is right for your yard and your yard's conditions? Um, and how do you do it? How do you go about transitioning a conventional lawn into a bee lawn or a native planting? 
Um, what are some of the other ways to support pollinators? What is the seasonal maintenance that you need to think about moving forward? And then I'll wrap up again with uh, just some additional projects. If you get all fired up tonight, you got all your notes and then you're starting to think about things like, where do I go buy my plants? Where do I go get my seed? Um, you know, where can I go to learn more? All right, so just to frame up the issue, we have ongoing continuing research that is looking into just how many different kinds of bees do we have in Minnesota? 500 different species of bees and counting. Um, I believe that the ongoing research project is actually scheduled to continue through 2024. And so the volunteers and the researchers that are out there are continually finding and becoming amazed by even more bee diversity that we have here in our states. Um, likewise, there are 157 species of butterflies that live in Minnesota. So while we might be familiar with some of these really, you know, flagship kind of species like the monarch butterfly or um, the tiger swallowtail, there are so many other species that are out there as well. Um, it is said that one out of every three bites of food that we eat is thanks to pollinators and 80% of the world's flowering plant species require, require pollinators to produce. And this is where you have to kind of use your eyes. It's almost like an eye test because everybody can probably see the bee here. You can almost certainly see all of these monarch butterflies that are all over this rough blazing star Liatris here. Do you all see the teeny tiny little one that's over here in the spider wart? And do you see the even teeny, teeny, tinier one that's here on the blue-eyed grass down at the bottom? I don't think there's any on the apples, but they're nice, delicious looking apples. Um, we do also have a Minnesota State Bee, which is the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. And um, this is often confused for other orange butt butted bees, uh, but the one that you are looking for is the one here on the right hand side. This is the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. It was designated as a Minnesota State Bee, but also unfortunately was designated as a endangered species in 2017. Um, so the reason that we're talking about ways to improve pollinator habitat is because we are seeing pretty alarming declines. Um, monarchs got added to the IUCN red list in 2022. This is kind of a world worldwide endangered species list. Um, the USDA estimates that wild bees declined 23% across the United States just in a five-year period through 2008 and 2013. And like I mentioned, um, we've got some familiar species like that rusty patch bumblebee that are getting added to the endangered species list, even as we're working to try to create more habitat for them. So the reason you all play a lot bigger role than you might think that you do is that the majority of the land is actually privately owned, not publicly owned by governmental entities, at least in the Midwest and in the Eastern United States. 75% of the land in Minnesota is privately owned. And so you all play a really critical role in helping to create pockets of habitat that create connected quarters within our communities and between our neighborhoods. Oh, and I just realized I left a bunch of people hanging there in the waiting room, so we'll let them all in now. All right, so I'm gonna turn things over to James now and I'm gonna try to keep an eye on the chat and James, I'll just kind of pop in if I start to see some questions coming up while you're talking, all right? Yeah, for sure. And um, I think Angie brought up a really interesting topic as she started to talk about the rusty patch bumblebee. I think what's important to touch on with the rusty patch bumblebee is it is a bee species that used to be one of the most common bumblebees, honestly one of the most common bee species, not only in Minnesota, but throughout much of the United States. And the fact of the matter is you only get a state bee when there's something really critical happening, and for the most part, something not so good. And that unfortunately was the case with the rusty patch bumblebee, where we've lost about close to 90% of the population of rusty patch bumblebees that existed up until the year 2000. So they're really experiencing some harsh decline. That being said, kind of the factors that are affecting the rusty patch bumblebee and the general idea of population decline within bees, it's not something that's isolated to the rusty patch. It's something that's happening to all the bee species in Minnesota and so many of our bee species in 
the United States are at risk. So as we go through these different turf alternatives and this general concept of planting for pollinators, if you live in Minnesota, you have this really unique opportunity to conserve an endangered species within your own yard. And if you live outside of Minnesota or you know, just taking a more holistic perspective, we have this really unique opportunity to kind of reimagine how we plant our yards to not just have them serve for aesthetics, and these options will be really nice aesthetically, but also for kind of bring conservation to the forefront. So the three turf alternatives that are listed there, low maintenance turf, sedges and native grasses, and bee lawns, they're going to be presented to you in this order because they're going to kind of drift from the most familiar to things that are far more novel. Where the low maintenance turf, you'll still have your turf grass. It'll just be a little more conservation friendly. And then we'll go into things that incorporate more and more flowering and native plants. So the first question that I get from so many individuals is, why do we even have turf grass in the first place? And the fact of the matter is that if you're not using your yard areas, if you're not using your lawn space, you can absolutely convert those to some form of a native planting to maximize the ecological impact that that area will have. Um, I am a conservationist. I like to still think that I am an albeit fledgling athlete to an extent. I can still play some beer league softball. And I've definitely fielded enough fly balls to know that it's a lot easier to do it in turf grass than it would be to do that in a four foot native wildflower prairie. So the answer to the question of why do we even have turf grass at all, it's entirely tied to functionality and recreation. You can play with your dog in a turf grass lawn. You can congregate with friends and neighbors and family in a turf grass lawn. It gives you this opportunity and potential for recreation that you just can't really recreate in that native, more prairie-like ecosystem. So when we're thinking, why do we have turf grass? If there are areas in your yard that you still want to maintain the opportunity for recreation, that's where these kind of more familiar turf grass alternatives are going to come into play. What I'd hope we can all recognize is that it's important to find some of these alternatives because of just how much upkeep and maintenance and the inputs that we put into our turf grass lawns. Every time we fertilize our lawns, there's a potential for those nutrients within the fertilizer to leach off into nearby bodies of water and create eutrophication or algal blooms, where the nitrogen and phosphorus that is in our uh, fertilizers, when those leach off of our landscapes and get into those nearby bodies of water, they create big problems. Uh, over the past two years, it has really become apparent how much water we use within our lawns, where believe it or not, in Minnesota, it actually used to rain over these past two years, that really uh, started to become more and more of a rare occurrence. Now everyone's trying to look for these more drought tolerant vegetative species, and that ties right into water use. If you still have a Kentucky bluegrass lawn, these past two years have probably been a nightmare because of how much water you had to use to keep it nice and green. We're gonna talk about a lot of options today that don't require nearly as much water where you know conservation is gonna be just more of a focal point. They're gonna be more resilient in nature. And also every time we mow, if we're using a, uh, a conventional mower, we're expending fossil fuels. And if we want to kind of have a, uh, a strong impact in terms of controlling our emissions, the less we mow, the better. And we're going to talk about lots of options where we can kind of uh, reduce our mowing quite a bit. So all of those ideas have been discussed quite a bit in the idea of the turf grass lawn. I know the lab that I graduated from, the Turf Grass Science Lab at the University of Minnesota, has been thinking about reducing inputs for decades now. But that bottom bullet point, this idea that our turf lawns lack e ecological function, that's a bit of a newer concept. And that's something that we're really going to hone in on today and think about how can we bring that ecological function back into our lawns. And something that I'd hope we can all agree on as well is that we probably have way too much turf grass. So what this map on your left shows is turf grass um, areas of the United States, where anywhere where you see those darker green colors, that represents an area of high turf grass prevalence. So me and my New York friends, we could see that New York City is absolutely an area where we have a whole lot of turf grass. Um, if anyone is joining us from California, maybe Southern California, you see another big blotch of green in there showing even more turf grass. But even if you start to hone in on the Midwest, you see a big patch of green right in uh, the Twin Cities area, right in the Chicagoland area, where really all, throughout all of these urban centers in the United States, you can see a big patch of green, meaning there's a lot of turf grass. About 2% of the continental United States is turf grass. So we can start to think about one, how can we use these areas for conservation? And two, how can we convert these areas when they're not being used into something that's gonna be a little bit more productive from an ecological point of view? So starting first, we're gonna be talking about low maintenance turf. 
if you want to have maybe the more typical or traditional lawn appearance, you just want something that's going to be a little bit more eco-friendly, this is going to be the perfect option for you. Um, there's going to differ in how much traffic they tolerate. So I'm going to start off talking about one that's going to be great for traditional aesthetics and heavy traffic, and then we'll start to move into more and more alternative kinds of turf. So a term that I'm going to be using quite a bit is low maintenance or low input, where the idea here is that all of those inputs we put into our traditional turf grass lawns, we want to reduce those. So the three characteristics we look for in a low input lawn is we want drought tolerance. We want these areas to be able to survive and thrive without excessive water use. We want a slow vertical growth rate. The slower these vegetative species grow, the less frequently we have to mow them. And we also want low fertility needs where the less nitrogen and phosphorus and you know, fertilizer we're dumping onto our lawns, the less potential there is for those nutrients to leach out into nearby bodies of water. Um, I, when I moved to Minnesota, I knew this was the land of lakes, so to say. What I didn't realize was that more than 50% of them were considered contaminated. So lowering our fertility needs can go a great way in reducing those, uh, those contamination figures. And once we start to kind of reduce those inputs, we can more realize the benefits of a low input lawn. So one of the most important benefits is tied directly to water quality. The reason why we want to have some turf grass in our areas, and I look outside my window at the what would normally be turf grass in April that is still covered in snow, is they form such a dense mat in our yards, and that helps to capture and infiltrate stormwater runoff and the contaminants that would go away with it. Um, in addition to that, there's the filter of um, the filtration of contaminants, carbon sequestration, and of course the release of oxygen where all green plants release oxygen, and even things like moderating air temperature and reducing noise, kind of more human focused elements there. So the most familiar turf grass alternative is going to have even better quality ratings than Kentucky bluegrass, and aesthetically most folks would not even be able to tell the difference between a lawn planted with tall fescue like you see here and your traditional Kentucky bluegrass lawn. So starting first, you know, this being something that's going to be for the folks that want the traditional lawn look, these actually grade out higher than Kentucky bluegrass lawns, the lawns planted with tall fescue. What's really a big important feature from a conservation point of view is how drought tolerant tall fescues are. So the picture here shows 45 days of different turf grass species without rainfall or really any access to irrigation or moisture. You can see the Kentucky bluegrass has already gone dormant, potentially even dead, while the tall fescue is still nice and green and beautiful, tall fescues can go upwards of 60 days without any access to irrigation and moisture and still retain their beautiful color. So if you're looking for something that's going to be more drought tolerant, tall fescues are a fantastic option. They also have great wear tolerance where now even more and more sports fields are starting to use tall fescues where you can run on them, you can play with the kids, the dogs, etc. And these will stand up to that traffic great. Um, and they do really well in sun and shade. I can't tell you how many times folks have told me, I don't know what to plant in the shady parts of my yard. Grass never works. It's really just because they're putting uh, Kentucky bluegrass in an area where they need a shadier option. Kentucky bluegrass only likes sunlight. These tall fescues work really great in both sun and shade. Um, and to go one step further, so still under that turf grass umbrella, would be the fine fescues. So what's unique about these is they have a really fine leaf texture. So while most turf grasses will continue to grow straight vertical the entire way through, once fine fescues reach about four to six inches, they start to lay over themselves and form a really nice wave-like function, uh, wave-like aesthetic like you see in that picture. But why I think they're such a great option is because of how low input they are. So if we start first with fertility needs, they have about one-sixth the nutrient uh, requirement as compared to Kentucky bluegrass, where when it comes to fertilizing a yard, if you simply leave your clippings in your yard, that is all the nitrogen that the fine fescues need for an entire growing season. The feature that folks tend to like best is that these are very slow growing. So most folks will mow their lawns, and of course it varies seasonally, about once every seven to 10 days if they have Kentucky bluegrass. These fine fescues, the recommendation is to mow once every four to six uh, weeks. So about once a month, perhaps even a little bit less than that. They do great in sun and shade, and they have great drought tolerance. So when we think about Kentucky bluegrasses, their root systems are about three to six inches in depth. When we talk about the fescues, now we're measuring our root depth in feet. So fine fescues, about a three-foot root depth. Tall fescues, sometimes as much root depth as six feet. 
And what you get when you have deeper roots is you have a better um, ability to pick up moisture from within the soil. So because these fescues have those deep root systems that are able to capture more moisture, they have much stronger drought tolerance. The only drawback, the only negative to the fine fescues that I find to be a little bit of a barrier is their low performance with regards to traffic tolerance, where this isn't to say that you can't have typical recreation or walk through a yard planted with fine fescue. It's more so that you would want to mix in some, uh, some turf grass that has a little bit stronger traffic tolerance if you've got kids or uh, dogs running through these yards pretty constantly where what a lot of folks will do is they'll mix some fine fescue with some tall fescue if they wanna have a really nice eco-friendly lawn that can tolerate some foot track. Again, a no-mow mixture. So some folks choose, I only wanna mow this once or twice per year, really reduce the amount of work that needs to be done, really reduce the amount of fossil fuels we're expending to maintain our yard areas. And this is that kind of wavy aesthetic I was talking about, where rather than growing vertically the whole way through and staying erect, they just lay over themselves and make this really nice wavy-like uh, pattern. Uh, some more no-mo mixtures that have been planted across the Twin Cities and a beautiful one out by Stillwater, where, Angie, do you have some insight as to where this photo was taken, perhaps, where I've only seen it from you? And I think we would need you to unmute. I'll take you back here. Oh, good. There we go. It was so weird. It was like I suddenly couldn't unmute myself. Um, <laughs> yes, I love my my favorite part of this lawn is actually the name of the homeowners because this is Tatiana and Boris Zemkuznikov's home. And they obviously have an enviable view of the St. Croix River there on the North Hill in Stillwater. Um, but we worked with them on a native planting rain garden projects that are in the front and the backyard. And then they also, you can kind of almost see the line right here where the low mo stops and they have like a little um, edging of regular turf just along the, the very edge by where the bench is. Um, so that area they kept mowing and then put the rest into a low mo. That's all I have to say about that one, but it's a very, very beautiful property that they have. Yeah, and I think it's always, you know, nice to see residents that have incorporated it themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of drawing back to this picture, so the fine fescue, just the same as the tall fescue, able to survive extended periods of drought, where the fine fescue after more than a month without any sort of access to moisture stays nice and green. So I must admit, I am a nerd at heart. I try to not put too much data into the presentations that I do, but sometimes you read a research paper and you see a table that really speaks to you and you just have to point it out. So out actually uh, right in the Chicago area, they did this really exciting to me study where they looked at how much carbon emissions is associated with different types of lawns, where they compared a low input lawn to a high input lawn. And they found that low input lawns have one third the carbon footprint of a high input lawn. So that means simply by changing from turf grass species X to turf grass species Y, you could reduce your carbon footprint to one third of what it currently is, simply by kicking the Kentucky bluegrass to the curb and using one of the more eco-friendly turf grass species we discussed here. So again, I try not to go too heavy on the figures, but this is one I like to think that I read all these really boring turf grass papers so I could synthesize them, give you the important bits, and then you don't have to read that stuff. So these fescues are gonna be the most grass-like options, but if you want to go even a step further, there are some native grass-like options as well that can be used. We'll talk about some sedges and some native grasses. So there's all sorts of different sedges, just like there's all sorts of different turf grasses. Pennsylvania sedge, fox sedge, ivory sedge, plains oval sedge. And just like with these turf grasses, they each have their different uses when they're most appropriate. So if you have a sunny, dry area in your yard, uh, fox sedge is a really great option. This is one where if I were to go to like the Anoka sand plains, this is without a doubt the native grass or sedge option that I would be recommending because of how well it does in dry sandy soils. Uh, pen sedge, I like to think of this as maybe the most adaptable one where I've seen it thrive in full sun, dry soil areas all the way through pretty shady yards that, can, that get quite a bit of moisture. Um, and then in dry, uh, dry shade, uh, plains oval sedge, ivory sedge, and of course pen sedge, Honestly, like when in doubt, I throw pen sedge in and I just forget about it because it is so adaptable. Um, 
Calaria macrantha, prairie june grass. This is one that's really interesting, where even from that picture alone, you can probably see that aesthetically it's the most similar of the native grasses to what we have in our head as our typical turf grass aesthetic. So of course, this is what it looks like when it gets grown out really tall, but you actually can maintain it like a turf grass lawn if you prefer the lower height of cut, the, the aesthetic associated with that. And in terms of potential, it has incredible low input potential, excellent heat tolerance, ex, uh, you know, excellent uh, drought tolerance, it requires very little fertilizer and it grows really slowly. The issue is, is it doesn't spread and establish quite as thickly as a traditional turf grass lawn. And the real kind of um, bottleneck here is simply cost. Where the turf grasses that we use today, they produce tons of seed from a farmer's point of view. So it brings the price down. People are able to get access to these really easily. Prairie June grass doesn't produce quite as much seed. So it makes it a lot more expensive on the market. Where on average, I would say a, a pound of prairie June grass is going to be five to eight times more expensive than a pound of a traditional turf grass. That being said, we all, you know, have different amounts that we're willing to invest into our lawns, where if you don't mind the heavier price point, prairie june grass is something that you might want to consider for a low input native option. And there are some other native turfs, uh, native grasses that are similar. Buffalo grass, another one that's becoming more and more popular. Blue grama I see quite a bit, where the story tends to be the same. They have great low input potential, but they are pretty costly to install. So the third option here, this is the one that I am first certain most passionate about. So bee lawns were the topic of my graduate work. And here we're kind of adding on to that idea of natural resource conservation, the idea that we wanna start incorporating low growing flowers for the benefit of our pollinators. So flowers that can be used for their pollen and their nectar to provide food for bees. And the idea here is simple, where we want to take that traditional turf grass lawn, work in some low growing pollinator friendly flowers where all the flowers I'll talk today, talk about today will bloom at six inches or lower, most of them three inches or lower, and create this really nice matrix of turf grass and flowers, where we keep in the turf grass because we want these to be nice and thick and lush, and also because we want folks to be able to maintain that opportunity for recreation. We want folks to be able to play in these, gather in these, while still providing food for bees when the flowers are in bloom. So the goals of a, mate, of a bee lawn are threefold. We want them to be low maintenance, we want them to protect the pollinators, and we want them to help improve local water quality. Something that I always try to point out about bee lawns is these are not supposed to be an alternative to your native wildflower prairies. Native prairies kind of fill a different niche, where this is for a very specific use where you want to enhance the ecological value of your turf grass areas. So again, low maintenance, those three characteristics I talked about earlier, drought tolerance, slow vertical growth rate, and fertility needs, these are directly tied to the conservation of water, reducing mowing, and reducing nutrients leaching off of our property. Pollinator protection, I would hope this is the most obvious goal of a bee lawn, where we want to invite those pollinators back in and provide them with some high quality food. Um, and when it comes to kind of what is the value of installing a native planting, when I, when I worked with Lawns Legumes Estate Program in Minnesota, some folks struggled to like make the connection of how does my individual planting make a difference when it comes to the conservation of pollinators. And what I try to tell folks is we're not working individually here. We're not all gonna save the, uh, the, the rusty patch bumblebee by ourselves. What we're really trying to do is create connected corridors here where the, the foraging range of pollinators differs from 500 feet to many, many miles. What we wanna do is make sure that our plantings are acting kind of like rest stops along a pollinator highway, where at each of our homes, there's some snack for our pollinators where they could stop and get the nutrition that they need and make it to, you know, along their journey, such that soon enough, Minnesota and hopefully the entire U.S. will be one large interconnected pollinator corridor. Um, Angie, I believe that you sourced this figure. So if you had more you wanted to add about this one, definitely pop on in. Nope, that was basically my intent for sharing this as well, is just to think of your home as part of a larger corridor that is, you know, including your neighbors, including all sorts of other people in the community. And if you can help to create one more stop in that highway, then yeah, then it helps the, the bees and the butterflies have a few more places where they can be. Um, as we're starting to have questions in the chat, do you want to field them as we go? Or do you want to wait till a good stopping spot, James? 
This feels like as good a point as any to take at least a few. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Um, there is This is one of the most common questions that I get, and I'm curious what your response is. <laughs> and, um, with the taller grasses, is there a concern with introducing a habitat for ticks? That is a concern, of course. Anytime you have taller grass, it is you know, potentially tick habitat. Um, you know, there's always going to be some give and take when it comes to different plantings where, you know, even the same goes for native grasses and wildflower areas where, you know, the more we bring in those taller vegetative species, it is a potential for ticks to be present in your yard. Yeah, I had heard some fairly interesting research that is kind of ongoing right now on if there are more ticks in a altered residential yard versus having one that is more natural, more native. And I'm kind of waiting to see what the published results will say. Um, but there are, you know, a few people who I've heard saying, well, if it is actually, you know, like a fully restored native habitat, it may not have more um, ticks than you would if it was a tall overgrown lawn next to a woods. Uh, mm. But yeah. I, I think that the research is still out on that one. Um, but here is a related question. Of the low maintenance lawn options, how deer resistant are they? Are the deer eating the lawns? Um, so I must admit, I mentioned before I'm from Queens, New York, where for me, wildlife was like, you know, <laughs> rat and pigeon. Um, seeing deer, I still get excited every time I drive past one, unless I'm on, unless they're getting too close to the road, where I don't think deer eat grasses. I do know that they'll eat some of the flowers that we're about to talk about. Um, probably more flowers than we'd like. One mm -hmm. of the flowers in the bee lawn mix, actually the creeping thyme, to jump ahead a tiny bit, is a natural deer deterrent. I've seen folks even use it as a border plant, a perimeter plant, to help keep the deer out. But when it comes to grasses, at least the turf grasses, I'm pretty certain that deer do not feed on those. But yeah, Angie, I've not heard of them eating grasses either. I, it's mostly... People are complaining about them eating the flowers for sure in their yeah. gardens. And we have, um, if you're in Washington County where I live, I know we have very large and robust deer herds. I still get very excited about seeing them as well. But yes, they do um, in some of the neighborhoods put a lot of pressure on people's gardens. Um, I see a question here. Are there concerns about native planting spreading to a neighbor who wishes to have a traditional lawn? And John, I do think that that is a reasonable concern that if you know your neighbor has a very conventional traditional lawn and would not want your native plantings creeping onto it, it would be wise to think about having some sort of barrier to try to minimize how much that happens because it will. I mean, the, the native plants, that they are beautiful and wonderful and I love them, they do move, they do spread. Um, so you know, as much as possible, if you could have even an actual edging versus just relying on turf to be the thing that it would stop, that would stop it from moving over into your neighbor's yard. Um, you know, I always kind of snicker a little when I see some of my native plants have, you know, <laughs> popped up on either side of the fence where we live, but, um, you know, not everybody enjoys them as much as I do, I know. Um, and let's see, to what extent are these grasses native to other areas? And are there any resources to find what native grasses are native in your area if you live in, say, Montreal, for example, instead of Minnesota? You know, this puts a damper on things because I was about to point that question to the USDA map <laughs> of plantings. And of course, this was a question from a Canadian. So I must say, I am not quite as familiar with the you know native plant databases that exist in Canada. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure if they have them, they will give you, you know, the, the the extent of these native grasses and where each individual species is native to. Unfortunately, I mean, I'm just getting around to really honing in on where these are native to in the U.S. So outside of the U.S., I am I'm just not the right resource for you. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's all the questions for now. So you can um, kind of carry in. I think we're moving into how to do it, right? That is correct. How to get it done. <laughs> yep. uh, and this is kind of a topic that we touched on before, but to kind of put some pictures to uh, the power of the individual planting, this looks at uh, native plant habitat in Minneapolis. We're starting first on the picture of the left, 
those dark green areas show native plant remnants. So what's left over from the native woodlands, the native prairies, et cetera, that existed prior to human settlement. In the middle picture, what we've done is we've overlaid a small buffer over those areas to represent the distance that a small pollinator could fly. So thinking back to that graphic that Angie had on just a few minutes ago, where those smaller pollinators have very short flight ranges, you know, now we can kind of visualize how much mobility a small pollinator would have within Minneapolis if we were relying solely on those prairie remnants, those native plant remnants. When we go to the image on the right, what we see is the degree of connectedness that exists when we start to consider rain gardens that have been installed from folks who have attended Metro Bloom's workshops. That is a very specific small population. And even with that, we can already see so much more connectedness throughout Minneapolis. When we consider that there are so many more native plantings than what's represented on that map, you can kind of start to see the power of the individual native planting. We see more and more of those green patches popping up, more connectedness throughout our cities, and we create a much more um, resilient pollinator corridor. So I mentioned that the third goal of a bee lawn is stormwater conservation. And I hope when you look at this picture, what immediately comes to mind is, my goodness, that is not what I expected a beelon to look like. And you'd be exactly right, where this is a rain garden, where when I'm doing a site visit with a resident and they tell me that their number one goal is to improve local water quality and reduce stormwater runoff, without fail, what I do is I help them site a rain garden. That being said, what I think is important to remember is that even large rain gardens are only gonna be a couple hundred square feet big, and when we consider that the average urban or suburban yard is several thousand square feet big, this means that we have literal thousands of square feet unconsidered when it comes to how can we better manage stormwater runoff and, and local water quality. And that's where I think the bee lawn can come into play, where because of the grasses and flowers included in the bee lawn mixes have much deeper, more extensive root systems, they can really help us infiltrate and capture much more what would otherwise be stormwater runoff. So now we can talk about the actual building blocks of a bee lawn, starting first with turf grasses. So a familiar face here would be the fine fescues, where in addition to being super low input, we, when we want to kind of co-establish flowers alongside grasses, we have to think about the grass as a potential biological competitor. Fine fescues are not overly aggressive, so they allow flowers to coexist with them, which makes them a perfect fit for a bee lawn where we want to intentionally introduce flowers into a turf grass stand. When it comes to the flowers that we use, that's where things can get a little bit trickier, where we need these flowers to be able to establish in Minnesota home yards, and that's just a nice way of saying we need flowers that can survive and continue to bloom after being mowed. Where we're not saying you have to stop mowing in these areas completely, we wanted to specifically select flowers that will continue to bloom after mowing. We also didn't want to just choose any old flower. We only wanted to use flowers that provide high quality food for bees. A species that we get lots of questions about is Creeping Charlie. It does great in yards, it's a little too great, honestly. And um, it responds well to mowing. Unfortunately, its rewards are very low quality for bees, so it just didn't make the cut for us. It's also an invasive species, another important thing to note. And then as best we could, we wanted to try to incorporate native flowers, where this is one that's been an interesting and exciting journey. So in terms of the flowers that we've had success with, self heal is kind of like the poster child, where it is, yes, a native species, and it is used by a diversity of bee species. So we expected this to be used primarily by large bee species, where if you look at this flower, you can see a really long, what we call corolla or floral neck. And when flowers have a long neck like this, you need a really long bee tongue to get in there. That being said, the bee on this flower here, an osmia bee, is not by any extent, by any measure, a large bee species. How small bees were able to use the self heal, they actually crawl into the floral head, grab the nectar, grab the pollen, crawl out and fly away. It is as cute as it sounds, at least in my opinion. Um, there was also previous research that suggested that this, was, this flower was primarily a nectar source. We found some really cool evidence that suggested that bees were also using this flower for pollen, which is really important because when folks talk about specialist versus generalist bees, that is tied entirely to the collection of pollen. Bees will use any old flower for nectar. When it comes to pollen, they're way pickier. So when we watch this video, what I want you to look at is how the bee moves its legs while on this flower. What you can see it doing is it's brushing its legs through its hairs, showing textbook what we call combing behavior. So because we saw that calming behavior, it was some really exciting evidence that self-heal 
is not just a source of nectar, it's also a source of pollen for bees. So if you're a pollinator nerd like myself, really exciting to see that. If there's one little factoid that I would want folks to remember about the self heal, it's this one right here, it's that more than 95% of the bee visitors that we observed on self heal were native species. So if you're looking for that poster child native flower to incorporate into a yard to help out native bees, self heal is your answer. Cupid thyme is this tiny, wide open flower that lends itself really nicely to small bees. But what's actually most exciting about this flower is when it blooms. So it blooms really late in the season, where if you live in Minnesota, like Angie and I, you know that early in the year, there's not too many flowers blooming, but we have our trees and shrubs starting to bloom, and you'll see bees all over those. In the middle of the season, think, you know, June, July, August, our native plant gardens are really taking off. That's where the bees are going to eat. But as we get later into the year, September, October, it's mostly like, where are the asters in my yard if you want to find bees? What's exciting about the creeping thyme is this species blooms late into the year, deep into September. So it's a nice plant option for those bees that are active late in the season that still need access to forage. Um, if we were to have a crazy year in Minnesota, like what if something nuts happened, like it snowed 12 inches on April 1st, and you needed a flower that could survive that? Angie laughs because as you Minnesotans know, we just got a foot of snow dumped on us. But creeping thyme is a flower that does really well through those freeze-thaw cycles with uh, excellent uh, summer hardiness, winter hardiness as well. Great drought tolerance, so great all-seasons flower. It does really nicely in full sun areas. And in line with the question someone answered before, a really good natural deer deterrent, where deer don't like the scent and the taste associated with the vegetation. And the one factoid from a pollinator POV that I'd like folks to keep in mind when it comes to creeping thyme is that it is the latest to bloom of all the bee lawn flowers, a great option for those late season bees. Dutch white clover, a species that I am so, so fond of because it is just so present and accessible for folks. And more importantly than that, it has really high quality rewards for bees, pollen that's really rich in protein content, nectar that's really rich in sugar content. And it's even a nitrogen mixer. Most folks don't realize that Dutch clover used to be included in lawn seed mixes through the 50s, 60s, 70s for decades. But when lawn companies realized that there was more money to be made in marketing clover as a weed, then all of a sudden they were making billions off these weed killers and Dutch white clover became a weed. But the reason I love clover is because it is such a great source of forage for honeybees and native bee species alike. Where on Dutch clover alone, we saw more than 55 bee species on this one floral species. That's more than 10% of the bees in the entire state of Minnesota. And when it comes to bee lawns across the board, more than 65 bee species. So we're saying if you just include these three little flowers into your lawns, you can conserve more than 10% of all of the bees in Minnesota. Just incredibly powerful. Another really exciting species to think about is common violet. One, it's beautiful. It blooms early in the year. Um, the reason that I think it's a really great option for pollinators is because lepidopterans, a, lot of, a bunch of species of butterflies, will lay their eggs on violet. So it's a host plant for bees, where the developing larvae will feed on the tissues, on the leaves themselves, rather than the adults using the flowers for nectar and pollen. Also, it's just really pretty to look at. Um, we're not too far away from Valentine's Day. I'd imagine that anyone who bought flowers for their significant other didn't get them a vase full of turf grass. You probably got them a vase full of flowers. And that's just to say, I like to imagine that we can all agree that flowers are just prettier than turf grass across the board. Or I hope that for all of you, certainly for me, this is just a more desirable aesthetic. So I mentioned wanting to use native flowers. So the Dutch clover and the creeping thyme are not native species. That being said, they're not invasive either. They don't overtake natives, but many folks like to use native species following this idea that native plants support native pollinators. Shout out Dr. Doug Talmy from my alma mater, the University of Delaware, been a huge proponent of that. Um, so we subbed out the non-natives, the clover and the um, creeping thyme, subbed in two natives, yak yarrow, which works incredibly in these bee lawns, and blue-eyed grass, which admittedly is a little bit more fussy than the other species, but an absolutely stunning species. Uh, Angie actually showed a beautiful picture of it before. So something that I want to touch on real quick is what about no mo may, where I always tell folks no mo may has the absolute best intentions in the world. That being said, when it comes to functionality, no mo may likely does more harm than it does good. The reason for that is grass tends to grow really, really fast in the month of May. 
So if we go the entire month of May and let our lawns reach 12, 15, 18, 24 inches before cutting them back, we're going to be imposing a ton of stress onto your lawns. A really common rule of thumb when it comes to turf grass science is you never want to cut off more than one third of the total height of the plant. So when we start cutting off 800, 900% the total height of a plant, that is big issues. And I'd imagine most of y'all are thinking, but it's just turf grass, who really cares? And the fact of the matter is, me, I don't care at all about turf grass. What I do care about is local water quality. And when we harm our, our turf grass and potentially kill it, we're gonna have a ton of exposed soil throughout our urban and suburban lots, which is just begging for stormwater runoff to roll through the area, carrying all sorts of contaminants into nearby bodies of water. If I'm a pollinator guy first, I am certainly a water quality person second. And because we don't wanna have those areas of exposed soil, that's why I really encourage folks to adopt what we call slow-mo summer, where instead of you know just going by alliteration as our source of science and adopting no mo may, we use some really tried and true um, directives from the turf grass world, from the pollinator world for slow-mo summer, where the idea is if we can reduce our mowing a little bit year round, raise our height of cut, let our turf grasses grow out to six inches and cut them back to four, use the more sustainable species like we talked about with the fine and tall fescues and intentionally incorporate beautiful low growing pollinator fla friendly flowers into our yards. I can absolutely promise you that's going to do way, way, way more good, immeasurably more good than simply just not mowing throughout the month of May. So now how to actually get these in the ground. So timing is so, so important here, where you can install these during spring, somewhere between April 15th and June 1st is recommended. You can install these in the late summer, kind of that summer fall transition, transition zone between August 15th and September 15th, and also as a dormant seeding typically between November 1st and November 30th. Do keep in mind that these dates are true of Minnesota. Um, if you live in uh, Tallahassee, Florida, your calendar is completely different than what we have here. So just keep that in mind. Um, with the dormant seeding, how it works is you put the seed down just before the frost, just before you know temperatures, soil temperatures drop below 32 degrees. The seed's gonna lie dormant until the following spring then it's gonna start collecting degree days as soon as possible and germinate that following spring. Really when it comes to timing, what I try to do is I'm just begging folks, please do not plant in the middle of summer when it's scorching hot. It is going to be so much more difficult to get these installed. Exactly, avoid the summer. Um, so installing a bee lawn, you can do this either as an overseeding or as part of a new lawn renovation. An overseeding is just simply dropping the bee lawn mix into your pre-existing turf. This is going to work really nicely if you have a mostly healthy stand of either Kentucky bluegrass or fine fescue turf. If you have a lawn that, say, uses some other turf grass species or potentially overrun with, three, with weeds, you might want to do this as a new lawn renovation. So how to install a bee lawn from an overseeding? It is so easy. I mean, you could do this in an hour, two hours, potentially even less than that. Where step one, you mow that lawn as short as possible. Step two, you rake away the clippings to expose the soil. A really important rule when it comes to planting from seed, it can only establish if it makes contact with the soil. Um, as you're doing that raking, try and break up the ground a little bit. Try and give it a really nice hard scraping to ensure that um, the seed has a soft landing. Step three, spread that bee lawn mix out. And the probably the most important step, keep that area nice and moist until you see signs of new plant germination. As for maintenance, a couple little tips. Try and keep your mowing height above three inches. That'll ensure you have constant access to blooms. And please do not use herbicides. They will, in fact, kill the bee lawn flowers. So an example of if you want to do this as part of a new lawn renovation, very similar. You want to remove the entirety of the turf or vegetation with either some hand, machine, or cultural method. Uh, after you do this, it's a really nice opportunity to add in some high-quality soil amendment as needed. I always recommend that folks get a soil test, the best 20 bucks you could spend in the gardening world. While you have that soil exposed, give it that nice hard rake to break up the ground, and then spread the seed mix out, rake it in such that to help the seed settle, cover it with a germination blanket where I've learned the hard way that if you leave seed exposed, it's gonna get eaten by critters. And then the steps are just the same, keep it moist, raise your height of cut, and don't use herbicides. So this is what a beautiful bee lawn, the same picture that I have behind me in my background here, looks like once it's fully established. 
This is one that I established during my grad student research at a local Minneapolis park. Um, in, certain, in terms of how to install a native planting, here we're going a step further. We're saying we want to kind of completely step away from the turf grass world, use some perennial ground covers. And we'll talk through some uh, different types of ways you can get rid of your old vegetation and get ready to install a native planting. So an easy way to do this is with a machine. You go to your local ready rents, you go to your local small equipment shot, and you rent either a sod cutter or a mini excavator, sometimes called dingo. Even a sod kicker, a little foot power device, is going to be so much better than doing it the old fashioned way with a shovel, where believe me, I have had enough back pain from doing these by hand that I know machines are going to be your best friend here. So a sod cutter or a dingo for larger projects and a sod kicker, the foot power device for smaller projects. What's really exciting are some of these cultural methods. So I'm going to give kind of a brief overview of some of these. But if you want to get more in depth on these organic site preparation options, the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation has a fantastic guidebook called their Guide to Organic Site Preparation. If you want to get the in-depth scoop here, definitely check out that guidebook. So what we're looking at here is a process called solarization, where what you do is very simple. You lay a black plastic out over the top of the vegetation that you want to remove. Over time, that area is going to collect heat and it's going to be smothered, and that heat is going to kill the vegetation underneath. You want to let it go for a pretty good amount of time, say three or four months. Uh, it'll vary a little bit depending on how much direct sunlight the area gets. And after that window of time has elapsed, you pull back the blanket, you rake away the dead vegetation, and voila, you have a fresh area to plant into. Another one that I bet a lot of the gardening folk here are familiar with would be a sheet mulching. Pretty similar in nature, where what you do is you mow the turf as short as possible, and then you create kind of what I call a lawn lasagna, where you spread out different layers of compost and cardboard and you soak it in between layers. Again, you wait a little bit, two, three, sometimes even four months for all of those materials to break down. And that mixture of cardboard and compost will actually create a really high quality soil-like substrate to plant directly into. Um, once you have the soil exposed, some things you could do for best results. One, turn the soil. A lot of our urban and suburban yards can be compacted, meaning they're really tough to the foot. Uh, if you turn the soil, it'll loosen that soil up really nicely. Adding compost is also really great, not only for having loose soil, but for adding in some organic matter. And me personally, when I'm working with native plants, I like to mulch the area before I put my plants in as plugs. Some other ways to support pollinators, and I'm gonna hand things back off. Oh, actually, no, I think this is still some more of me. So we kind of covered the traditional turf grass options and the bee lawn option. Now we're gonna work, work our way through some more native plant options. So lawns to legumes, this is a program that I used to be a project admin on. When I left uh, my previous job for a job with Twin City Seed, I had to give up that role, but I'm still very familiar with the program. So any resident in the state of Minnesota is eligible for grants of up to $350 to simply convert any area in their yard to a pollinator-friendly alternative. If you're interested in one of those grants, check out bluethumb.org slash lawns to legumes, where in my opinion, every single Minnesotan resident should be applying for this funding to you know, help install some great pollinator-friendly plants. So a really easy planting type to install are these pollinator-friendly trees and shrubs. I mentioned before that in the spring, there's a dearth of wildflower blooms. The exception to that is pollinator friendly trees and shrubs, where if you go on a walk in April, May, April, if you live in a normal state where April is actually considered spring, um, I see so many folks kind of focusing in on the dandelions when they're thinking, what are the bees eating right now? If you tilt your head up another 45 degrees and you check out a blooming service barrier, a blooming crab apple tree, those would be absolutely swarmed with pollinators, where these flowering trees and shrubs, they bloom in masses and those blooms are so attractive to our bees. And I believe Angie has some information about the tree sale that's going on. Yep, so in Washington County, Chisago County, several other counties throughout Minnesota, the soil and water conservation districts hold annual tree sales. And this is a really great way if you are wanting to do a large planting. Um, for example, at Washington Conservation District, they sell trees in bundles of 25 for only $40. 
you're getting little seedlings. So it's not probably what you want to do if you're just looking for one signature large tree to put in a front yard of a residential home. But if you're doing any kind of habitat plantings or uh, you know, reforestation, planting a windbreak, something like that, it's a really great way to get a large amount of trees very affordably. So um, the Washington Conservation District, the website is mnwcd.org, and they're currently accepting tree orders right now. You pick them up at the Washington County Fairgrounds at the end of April. And I know that several other counties in the Twin Cities area and around Minnesota are also doing tree sales right now. So those are yeah. great resources to look toward. Yep. I gotta say that price is incredible. I know the, mm -hmm. when I was on the installation side of this business, like $25 per tree was our target price. So the value of that is insane. Yep. Um, a quick little note when it comes to planting trees and shrubs, uh, Jen Ellert, my old uh, coworker at Metro Blooms, she would whap me on the nose with a newspaper if I didn't say the term here, mulch donut, not mulch volcano. Far too often we see folks that are just piling the mulch up against the base of the tree, up against the trunk. When you do that, you are gonna choke out your tree. You're gonna restrict its access to water and nutrients, restrict its ability to grow and spread. When you leave some space out by the trunk, that is going to be so much healthier for the tree. Um, another option is these native plant pocket plantings, AKA small gardens. So the beauty in these is that they are small, they're diverse, and they're easy to install. Kind of something that everyone can install within their own lot. Where here, this is a beautiful native plant garden that was installed through lawns to legumes, where the key here is just, you know, realistically figure out how much space do you have in your yard that you're willing to dedicate towards pollinators and that you think is a reasonable undertaking from an effort point of view. If you can, just take out that turf grass, put in a small assemblage of native plants, and believe me, even if it's just a 10 square foot area, pollinators will, vis will visit, you'll be doing your help to help, to help conserve part, uh, you will be doing your part to help conserve pollinators. What we will say is we like to tell folks that chemicals, herbicides are an absolute last resort for a for, for converting an area into a pollinator friendly planting. If you do one of these small gardens, try and take out the vegetation by any means possible besides the use of chemicals. This is a beautiful one that was installed by a lawn legumes resident. This was just one year in and you can already see a beautiful diversity of species that was installed. One native planting variation that I always like to expose folks to is the rain garden. So we mentioned before that native plants aren't great just for pollinator conservation. They're also great for the conservation of natural resources. Where all a rain garden is, is it is a native planting with kind of a bowl shape to it. And that bowl shape allows the planting to capture a ton of stormwater runoff. We're talking tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of gallons here. And all you have to do is dig four to six inches deep to kind of um, achieve that goal of capturing that storm water. The fourth example would be the pollinator, pollinator meadow. And here Angie's gonna talk about another example of a beautiful pollinator meadow that was installed by the city of Stillwater or in the city of Stillwater, I should say. Yep, this one was actually out in the country out in Stillwater Township. And this was one that is in the Browns Creek Watershed District that Washington Conservation District worked with the landowner. As you can see, they had a really large yard um, the project size alone was a full acre and they had been entirely mowing this area all the way down to the pond. Um, the landowner was elderly, is elderly, she still lives there, um, and was really interested in reducing the regular mowing, um, knowing that there were steep slopes, wanting to have something that was habitat and lots of color, and also keeping in mind that it's something that actually transitions from being pretty dry at the top of the hill to very wet down at the bottom where the wetland is. Um, so if I do a click here, this is where you get to do the collective, ooh, oh, no, there we go. Ooh, ooh. see, isn't that so much nicer? Um, so this is, I think two years later, once the native planting had time to grow in, but just, you know, thinking back to how before it, kind of looked like something that you might see in a um, business park with one of those, you know, little fake ponds. And now it looks like a natural ecosystem again. Um, you know, it's a, a really beautiful transformation. All right, I think that's all I have to say about that one. 
Um, but just that, you know, there are lots of resources available. I was starting to type in the chat that if you do live in a watershed district, a lot of them have cost share grants available for these bigger projects, the rain gardens, the shoreline plantings, the, um, the pollinator meadows. And these are things that you could get in addition to the lawns to legumes grant. So you can actually double up and be able to um, get even more funding and get a lot more technical assistance as well. Yeah, and just one more additional note when it comes to these pollinator meadows is that you can install them either bite by bite, where some folks will do a few sections at a time, you know, maybe 25 or 50 square feet per weekend or every other week until they have this large kind of continuous planting. Some folks will rent some machinery, rip out all their turf and do it all at once. If you do it all at once, I'd recommend to use a mixture of seeds, plugs, and larger plants. The larger plants will give you some instant gratification, some instant results, instant food for bees as well. The plugs are kind of like the teenagers of the planting world. They're really cost effective and they fill in over time. And seed, it will give you that long-term sustenance. It's going to give you the best bang for your buck. I know that uh, Twin City Seed, we've got a seed mix that covers 2,500 square feet and it's only 50 bucks. So it kind of having a mix of all of those will give you kind of the now, the middle, and the later. It's kind of a Goldilocks way of uh, going about establishing your planting. Um, and a little bit on maintenance, where something that we notice is there's so much motivation for folks to get these in the ground. Sometimes the motivation can die away a little bit when it comes to maintaining a planting. Uh, and Angie, I'm going to pass things back to you for this one. Sure. Yeah. And I know there was a couple of questions related to maintenance in the chat. So I was kind of holding off on those, knowing that you were going to be talking about maintenance later on. Um, but I think one of the first things that I would want to talk to everybody here about, even before you're thinking about your new project that you're getting ready to plant, is just as we're thinking forward to when the snow finally melts and you start to get out there and, you know, start doing the things in your gardens, we're really trying to get the message out to people to wait, and I know it's hard, I know it's hard, I live in Minnesota, to wait until the daytime temperatures are consistently above 50 degrees before you start cutting down stems and raking leaves out of your garden beds. Um, because all of those bees and other beneficial insects that we're working so hard to create habitat for, what they're doing right now is they are either hibernating or else they have laid eggs that are in those plant stems and they need a chance to be able to hatch and come out, um, you know, come out of their hibernation, do whatever it is that they're going to do. Um, there's a lot of other, you know, little mammals, little salamanders, frogs, things like that, that are also still kind of in a stage of hibernation underneath the leaves. So we want to give them a chance to fully warm up and be able to uh, return to life here before we start cutting down the stems. If you really do want to cut down plant stems, they're just hideous, you can't take it anymore. Um, you can kind of loosely bundle it and put it maybe over in a back corner of your yard where the bees will still be able to emerge um, once they, you know, once they're able to. And then that way you won't just be throwing all the little baby bees away. All right. Um, Oh yeah, okay, but that continues into one other additional one other additional topic. Um, it's just that a lot of these native bees that we are talking about um, are not actually nesting in large colonies like what you might be seeing when you're seeing you know a paper wasp nest that's hanging from the underside of your roof. Um, a lot of these are solitary and they're ground nesting. Um, so don't be afraid to have a few bare spots in your gardens. Um, you don't need to cover everything in landscape fabric, don't need to put down mulch over everything. Um, you know, leave a couple little open areas where the bees are going to be able to get down there and, and be nesting underground as well. Okay, I think I'm turning it back to you now, James. Sounds good, we shall see. Oh yeah, so, so just some general points to keep in mind when it comes to year over year land care. So what I encourage folks to do is try to uh, go out and remove some weeds at least three times per year. Or if you can go out and remove weeds once on or near Memorial Day, once on or near the 4th of July, and once on or near Labor Day, you'll do a really good job of capturing those early, mid and late season weedy species. Some other things to keep in mind is to just be observant. Lots of you know planting planted areas will have really diverse mixtures when they go about being established. 
when you come back three months down the road or so, try to think of what plants are doing really well, what plants are maybe struggling, and what are the features of those plants that are doing really nicely. If you see that all of your plants that have really strong drought tolerance and that are full sun plants are the ones that are thriving, you can use that as information to help you select what other plants you might want to incorporate in your native plant area down the road. Um, when it comes to mulching, if you do mulch your native gardens, you'll probably want to replace that mulch about once every two years. Um, in the spring, as Angie mentioned, be patient. There are bees that are going to be kind of overwintering in there, hibernating in there until the following spring comes around. Um, if you're looking for a kind of a timestamp as to when things might be safe, when those dandelion blooms come about, that's generally when you're kind of safe to go start meddling in your garden. And the other side of the spectrum in the fall, if you can leave those stems that you cut back rather than you know, throwing them out and you know, trashing them, there will be pollinators that will use those for nesting habitat. So for the lawn options we talked about going all the way back to the beginning of this presentation, when it comes to mowing, uh, what we encourage folks to do is just consider raising your height of cut. If you mow your lawn from six inches down to four inches, rather than mowing your lawn from three inches down to two inches, you will be mowing much less frequently throughout the growing season, reducing the amount of carbon emissions, you, uh, you the output of carbon emissions. When it comes to fertilizer, both the tall fescues and the fine fescues um, require much less fertilizer than, than Kentucky bluegrass. So Kentucky bluegrass requires three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. Tall fescues by comparison require two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. The fine fescues require one half of a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. So with those fine fescues, all you really need to do is leave those leaves. And even with the tall fescues, still a much better option than the Kentucky bluegrasses. When it comes to irrigation, that is where you will see certainly the biggest difference. These past two years in Minnesota, there were folks that had to water like every other day in order to keep their lawns nice and green. With these fescues, you can easily go three plus weeks without any sort of moisture and they will, and those lawns will continue to look beautiful. The one thing that you might have to add to your lawn calendar when it comes to these fine fescues is a thatch removal. Thatch is just a buildup of kind of a degrading vegetation between the soil and between your living plants. Um, when there's too much of a buildup of that thatch, it can kind of choke out the plants a little bit. So if you just run a dethatcher through the area once per year, say, if you live in Minnesota, the middle or, you know, weeks two through four in the month of May, sometime within that time frame, you should be good to go. Um, and some resources that Angie's going to share with everyone. Yeah, I have a couple other maintenance questions that came in earlier. One is about how good the fine fescues or just the fescues in general are at keeping invasive species like dandelions and clover out. Um, I know I've actually, in my backyard, I planted fine fescues and I've really struggled with quackgrass and crabgrass. So I'm wondering if you have any suggestions on any of that, if people are going with the Lomo fine fescue as opposed to Elon. This is another one where you kind of have to weigh the pros and cons a little bit. We're the same way that these fine fescues are great for bee lawns because they kind of allow flowers to co-establish. They are a little bit more prone to weed infiltration because they're not as aggressive. They don't have as strong a vigor as say a Kentucky bluegrass. So, you know, you might have to be willing to accept some visitors into your lawn, but you're going to be doing so much more good ecologically for your you know, for your local ecosystem, where I do think it's still certainly a positive trade-off there. Sure. Um, the other question is related to clover. And if you're putting clover in your lawn, what are some ways you can prevent it from also creeping into your gardens? So in my experience, I've never really struggled with Dutch clover creeping into garden okay. areas, especially if you do just even the slightest bit of edging where you know, that rubber edging will certainly keep out a plant as docile as clover. Um, I've actually seen people use clover as a quote unquote living mulch. So kind of a used in between the native plantings in a yard because it's so docile by nature. Mm -hmm. Where Dutch clover, it's non-native, but it's not aggressive enough to outcompete the native plantings you'll be installing in your native plant areas. 
All right. Um, will a bee lawn do a better job of choking out other weeds like thistles and crabgrass, or is it going to be kind of equally bad as regular lawn? Um, so the flowers probably comparable to, and what I'll, what, what's probably important to know is that if you have some pre-existing stands of a really aggressive weed in your lawn, like a thistle, like a creeping Charlie, your bee lawn flowers are probably not going to win that arms race in terms of survival, where I know folks are often hopeful, like, hey, maybe these flowers can push out, you know, aggressive weed species X, Y, Z. The thistles, the the, the Creeping Charlies, they are the monsters that they are for a reason. They're so strongly competitive where that's just something to keep in mind. Yep. Um, okay, so I'm gonna kind of pick up here with some of the resources to help you get started. If you have never gone to the bluethumb.org website, I highly encourage you to do so, especially I know that there were some questions in the chat about like, what if I have shade? What if I have these kind of conditions? What might I plant there? The plant selector tool on bluethumb.org, you can enter in your yard's conditions. Is it sunny? Is it shady? Is it dry? Is it wet? Do I want it to be a grass? Do I want it to be a flower? And it will generate a list of all of the native species that would be best suited for your yard. So that is a really, really cool tool I always tell people about. Um, there's also going to be links to native plant suppliers and contractors and all sorts of information about pollinator gardens, rain gardens, shoreline plantings, and turf alternatives. So that's a very cool resource. Um, I mentioned that Washington Conservation District offers free site visits in Washington County. So if you live in Washington County, you can go there, sign up for those. We're not doing them right now. Well, there's 12 13, a million inches of snow on the ground. Um, but after the snow is finally gone, they will start doing the site visits. Um, and all of the resources from like our previous workshops, our previous workshop recordings for, you know, both this and other ones will be posted there as well. So you can go there to find all sorts of um, kind of other print resources and just recordings from other webinars. Um, if you are in one of these other counties, I included a link to what their website is. Not every soil and water conservation district has the same array of programs and offerings, but they will all have similar kinds of services and technical expertise. So um, regardless of where you are, if you are in the state of Minnesota, I would always reach out to your soil and water conservation district first because um, SWCDs do a really good job of being the connector that kind of tells you who is available that you can work with, what kinds of programs might you qualify for, what kinds of grants are out there. Um, Wild Ones is a native plant organization that has chapters all around the country. Um, and they also have put together this really great handout and if you want to, you know, I'll talk slow enough here. If you want to take like a little screen grab photo of this, um, this shows all of the native plant nurseries and seed suppliers that are in Minnesota and Western Wisconsin that might be ones that you would be easily able to drive to to buy plants. Um, I am not sure if it will be on my very next slide, but I would be remiss also if I didn't mention the fact that there are some great plant sales, maybe it's not in the next slide. Um, there are some great plant sales that happen every spring. Uh, so the landscape revival is one that happens in Oakdale and it happens in Shoreview. And um, if you give me a moment, I'll be able to find what the dates for those are. Um, but those are two events where they have a whole bunch of native plant nurseries all come together and have just a one day sale where you can shop from numerous nurseries all at once. Um, and a lot of the master gardener groups, like for example, the Washington County Master Gardeners do a plant sale in the spring and they have a pretty robust selection of native plants as well. I um, also wanted to do a shout out to a local Minnesota author, Heather Holm, who has these two really great books. Um, I have these they're, they're sitting on my bookshelf and I just pull them out all the time. Um, the Pollinators of Native Plants, you know, this one is so great if you're like, well, I'm planting this plant. What am I going to see after I plant it? 
And she just has all these great color photos that, you know, if you plant this purple cone flower, here's all the bees and butterflies that might come to your plant. Um, and then the reverse, if you now have your garden and you're looking at the bees and you're wondering what they are, um, then, you know, this bees and identification and native plant forage guide is really, really useful as well. Um, if you haven't also heard of iNaturalist, um, it's an app that you would put on your phone. I'm just typing it in uh, Naturalist, typing it in the chat here. Uh, I use this all the time because you can just take a picture of whatever, you know, mushroom, bee, flower, bird it is that you don't know what it is and you upload it to iNaturalist. It's crowdsourced by a bunch of nature nerds and people will, it will automatically generate recommendations based on where you're located for what the thing is that you're seeing. And this is, um, iNaturalist is a program that's worldwide. It's not just in Minnesota. Um, but then people will actually go through and they will verify. So if you look and you're like, yeah, this looks just like a gray tree frog, then somebody else will go back and they'll look at your photo and they'll say, yes, you guessed right. I agree. It is a gray tree frog. And you can feel confident that you have correctly identified uh, whatever the thing is that you just found. Okay. Um, so questions, questions, questions. You can type them in the chat or since we're kind of at the tail end, you can feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. And I'll see if in the background, I might potentially be able to find the dates of the landscape. Um, oh, landscape revival. I think that I can do it if I if I stall for time long enough by um, by talking, which is usually a pretty a thing that I'm pretty good at doing. <laughs> okay, um, June third. I'm I'm copying this here. June third will be the landscape revival in Oakdale. Okay. Yep, that's gonna be. Um, that's going to be, I believe, at the city hall is where it is usually located. And the Washington County Master Gardener plant sale is happening a little bit earlier than that. That will be on May 20th. And that will be happening at the Lake Elmo Fairgrounds, Baytown Township, if you want to be specific. Um, do you attract mice colonies by doing bee lawns? Not that I've ever heard of, but nope, James is shaking his head also. <laughs> yep, I don't think. Um, how densely do the bee lawn flowers have to be planted? Ah, great question. Yeah, so this is something that you normally establish from seed and you would plant it similar to how you would plant um, a turf grass stand where the planting rate that we recommend for folks is five pounds per thousand square feet. And this is a mix that you get at, if you live in Minnesota, most local garden centers here in Minnesota carry them. If you're outside the state, um, I know my company, Twin City Seed, we sell them right off our website. So pretty easy to find these days. Yeah. Um, recommendations on dealing with criticism against bee lawn and non-traditional turf lawns. This is something that it really takes the social norms changing. And I feel like it's happening. I feel like I have witnessed it happening over the past 15 years since I started my job that it used to be when I met people and I said the word rain garden, people didn't know what I was talking about. It was a handful of people who had native gardens. Um, now it seems to be more and more and more people embracing it, but it definitely is noticeably different from one community to the next. So for example, if I'm walking around in Stillwater, I'm seeing tons of people who are embracing, you know, Lomo May and the Bee Friendly Lawn and the Native Gardens. Um, Woodbury, depending on what neighborhood it is, I might not see any of that at all. Um, so I think, you know, trying to see if you can convince some neighbors to do the lawn with you helps. Um, a lot of people will put the little signs in their yards that say something like, this is a pollinator friendly habitat, or um, we have a whole bunch at my office, you can send me a note and I'll, I'll send you one that say this yard is part of the solution, you know, we're, we're doing this for, um, you know, for the birds and the bees. 
And that does at least let people know that you are intentionally changing your yard and you aren't just uh, being lazy and letting it go to pot. Like, um, you know, like some of, this, some of I feel like it's also kind of a generational change that, um, you know, maybe the, the up and coming generations are a little bit more willing to embrace this uh, more natural look. And one additional note where signage is always the first thing I point to, um, something that actually Angie talked about earlier, uh, edging, where even if our, you know, you and your neighbors have different philosophies, if you, you know, respect their wishes by just having some neat edging to make it look more presentable, you know, clearly delineate this is where the planting begins and ends, I find that that is also quite helpful. Yeah. Um, are there any communities in Minnesota that have covenants against bee lawns? Not that I know of. I haven't heard of anything like that. Oh, I know there was some big stink in like, I want to say Mankato, where oh. they tried to, I, but I don't know if that actually went through. Um, I think they should be good for most where oftentimes the issue with native plantings when it comes to city ordinances is height of cut. Because bee lawns start to bloom at three inches or so, they're generally good to go. Yeah, and we've, at least in my area, we've been doing a lot of work in trying to bring the public and local communities along together at the same time. So we're giving these same presentations to the city councils and, um, you know, we're talking with the city engineers, we're, we've got everybody on board. So in my area, at least, most of the cities are actually promoting these practices. They're saying we want people to move towards these low mo, these low maintenance turf options because of the, you know, massive impacts they're seeing to the groundwater aquifers from so much irrigation happening. Um, you know, they're asking people to plant native gardens. And so um, in a lot of cases, I think communities will be supportive. Um, there was a question on where do I find someone to build a garden? And if you go to that bluethumb.org website, there are also a whole bunch of uh, companies that specialize in doing native plant gardening, rain gardens, shoreline plantings. So that's a really great resource to be able to find a contractor or a landscape designer to work with. Yeah, anything else? Oh, James, what kind of bee is this? What are we looking at? That would be Agapossum texanus, a cute little sweat bee, very common in the state of Minnesota. <laughs> okay, I've heard of a sweat bee. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've already promptly forgotten the, the Latin name that you used for it, but I love that it just rolled off your tongue like no big deal. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure we all have our favorite bee species here. This one happens to be mine. <laughs> Okay, everyone. Um, like I said, I will send out an email to everybody who was registered tomorrow after I have a chance to upload a copy of this presentation to YouTube. Um, so you can see this and it will include links to some of these many resources that James and I shared tonight. I thank you for joining us. I thank you for being part of the change and Stay positive. The world will be green instead of white one day. <laughs> and thanks, thanks so much, James, for sharing all your expertise with us. Yeah, my pleasure. And thanks everyone who came out today. Okay. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out how to stop recording soon. There we go.